big video for you guys today. I know I don't do reviews anymore, but this is a review of a lifetime. I just finished closing up on my last real estate deal with jvpartnership.com. Uh, these guys really know what they're talking about, Eric and Barry Sandhouse. I went to their last meetup and recorded basically the whole thing on my phone. Not much context other than learning how to fix and flip properties for this specific meetup. And they go through the house and ask people basically what their opinions are and also teach people on what to look out for when you're doing your next property deal. So I just recorded everything, didn't really talk to the camera much, put the camera in weird places. But overall, I wanted you guys to have a better idea of the people I was working with so that you can have a better idea when you're ready to do your next property flip. So, or marketing. So anyways, I uh, hope you guys enjoy the video and uh, here we go, cheers. You missed me. Just take a look at that outlet and take a look at this outlet. What do you see the difference? One, three. Shinier? Well, one <laughs> <is>. <laughs> a little bit more observation on 30,000 square foot of uh, high wind ventilation. A little bit closer to the pole. Yeah, it has a third. So why is that the one type of The type of outlet? No, you, you didn't listen to me. Oh, I'm sorry, what did you say? You just can't have that. Tell me again. I said it has the three, three prong. Okay. And that one has two. So what does two prong mean? Well, that one's better. <laughs> why? <laughs> that, 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 could be fake, that, that could be faking you. Oh, that's true. What is the third wire for? Anybody? The ground? It's the right. ground. It's the ground, right? Yeah. So just because, so when you have a two wire house, right, right. there is no ground. It's two wires. Yeah. Okay. So the fact that they changed the receptacle doesn't tell you that they, that they ran a, a home run. For home run is considered a wire directly from the power box to something. It's a home run. That's industry language. So you don't know if that's a problem. Why would they just do that one and not these? More than likely, what they did was change the outlet so they have to break the prong off, whatever, yeah. like back to clean or whatever they were sticking in there. That's right. So the problem is if you don't catch that, these are the things why you don't. If you don't have the experience of, uh, you don't have to be, a, I have an extensive construction background. You don't need that. We've got peers, with people that we've taught or have other they taught themselves. They learn by mistakes sometimes, and usually those people have lost a lot of money on the first deal or so to learn. Yeah, because, that, because that would cost you $10,000 minimum, maybe more, because it's a, a 1,600 square foot house. It would cost you at least 10 grand to acquire this house. Because yeah. remember, they can't go underneath the house, it's no crawl space. You know, in the northern sections, you go underneath the house, it's easy, you go in the attic, you pop up. If you're in the basement, what you have to do is you just drill right there, you know, big deal. Here, you gotta bring the wires into the attic, right? You gotta rewire it, come down, open up drywall all over the place, it's a nightmare. And, then, and that $10,000 does not include the repairs of the drywall, right? That we made all over the place. So, how do we avoid that? I gave the answer, which the fellow missed it, is instead of letting your electrician give you a price for that, you say, no, I want you to change all the circuit breakers in the panel box to ground fault. What that does, the ground floor, the GFI, does not need a third wire for its trigger. Okay? So you change every outlet in the house, you change them all to the three prong, so that nobody gets to break off the prongs, even though it's just there for that reason. But now every outlet in the house is protected with a GFI at the circuit breaker. So the whole circuit, whatever each one's on that circuit breaker, is ground floor. That's a major mistake. Now, the next one somebody has said is one of my favorites is the plumbing. I've already looked in the garage, this house was re plumbed. This house probably, there's a possibility in the 60s, um, it probably was not poly, well, I think they came out in the 70s. And this was probably copper, and copper, unfortunately, in Florida, gets pinholes. You get usually the pinholes underneath the floor. We had our first house we bought in Florida, the kitchen was a spot where the tile felt warm. And I thought that going for a while, and one day it hit me. We got a leak under the house from the hot water side, and so uh, we had to re pipe the house. And that's what happens, if there's a chemical reaction, First of all, concrete moves, it expands. So when the pipes come up through the concrete, and they don't put a sleeve over something to stop it from rubbing and irritating you know, the, the concrete pinholes. There's also a chemical reaction that the copper touches the concrete. Or if copper touches any other metal, you can't disassemble the metal and cause corrosion. So you have your hot water tank and I'll get a little bit off this. But sometimes people get a smell on the cold water, I mean on the water, it's only on the hot water side. Every, every hot water tank on the top has a square nut has a sacrificial panel rod going down inside of it because of dissimilar metals. And, and, and boats, everybody that's a boater has that. You know, that on the prop, you have something so that's supposed to sacrifice, it's sacrificial, so the corrosion happens there instead of the rest because dissimilar metals don't like each other. But anyway, that's that. So, plumbing-wise, you want to check that. There's three major things you got to check. 
you can check the electricals, make sure it's not a two wire. You want to check the house to make sure it doesn't have polyvinyl plumbing, which is a gray, bluish, plastic. Let's go in the garage and give you an idea of what it looks like. Come in here. Everybody watch this step coming down here. There's two, two baby steps. There's light in here. How much is it to fix the plumbing? Plumbing um, can be around 30, 800 to 4,000. It depends, but they go by drops. How many drops? My partner says to you, how many drops? What it means is every spot, like, like okay, the sink is two drops, hot and cold water. A toilet would be one drop. They have to be another two drops. So depending on how many drops you have, now this is that six fixtures in this house. That's another interesting thing. When you go to your property appraiser's office, and I'm going to show you guys in a minute. It's unplugged. It's unplugged. It's all right. It's just so warm in here. Hey, Eric, you can open that door. You can get any breeze coming through. Um, anyway, uh, what were they just talking about? The um, drops. The drops. Right. Just before I get back. Well, last part of the morning, you asked me that question. So, you know, the, and what they have to do is, is, let's say the water's coming in right here outside. So they'll come in, break it through the garage right here. They'll run up along the wall here, just like that piece of wire. And they'll go up in the attic. And then just like, this house has already been done. You see how the, the pipes are coming down, these red pipes? Now, I don't like that they use red. Red means hot, but they put it on the cold and the hot instead of either using the clear or the white. And these are older fittings. Well, that's a hand. Uh, this is different. This is PEX. But the, the problem that I'm telling you to look for is, is around this size. This is not this or clear, but it would be about that size, right? And you can see this is plastic. It had these little fittings on it, like clamped on, but it would be a bluish gray. You see that? <clears throat> what happens is they, the fittings and the pipes would explode and you get a flood. So if you buy a house and have that in there and you have a leak, your insurance company's not going to pay you. You'll find some way to get it in there but if you have polygrammon coming and not pay you. The next thing that they'll put not pay you on is the panel box. Um, it's over there. It, it, it's oh, where is it? Right in the corner. Okay, so the next thing you want to look for yeah. is yeah. you want to make sure that that massive flood is not all. Luckily, I was home every single time it happened, but if I had been gone, it destroyed the house. Did they cover you? What's that? What happened to you when you had to leave? They, the same thing you're talking about, where they put the fitting on the, the PVC pipe at the, in the bathroom. But luckily, I was home every single time it happened. So, I mean, the last, first time I did it, I mean, it's a hose thing, right? And I'm walking upstairs carrying towels, and boom! What the hell is that? And water, water's coming out of every this, vent. This town out here. Oh, okay. I don't, it's just a high don't we have, well, plenty of time to talk about your story, but I wasn't being rude. No, no. I just wanted to encourage everybody else that we just get out of the process. That's, you have to, the next major problem, if you miss this, is $2,000 minimum, depending on what electricity you use. That is made by Federal Pacific, FPE, right? Um, they're out of business, they were sued out of business. The purpose of a circuit break box, or a panel box, what you want to call this, is that the trip, the, tur the circuit breaker is supposed to trip. If there's, if there's a wire that's maybe loose and it's arcing and it's creating heat inside before there's a fire, you want that to trip and shut the electricity off to it. Which is like, you know, if you see the lawsuits that are happening now out in Maui uh, because they didn't shut the lights off, the electricity off, that they're now being sued the electric company because it's starting fires. So this company got sued at a, because the circuit breakers didn't trip. And it needed to trip, so it didn't trip, but now the fire started and burns the house down and I don't know if people got killed, I never researched that. But they were sued as into you know class action lawsuits are out of business. If you find that the same problem, obviously this house hasn't burned down, right? It's still here, but you don't want to take that chance. You're sitting on a on a landmine. You know, there's bombs that have never went off in the final four or two. It doesn't mean you go play with it, right? So anyway, the same problem. If you have this here and you and you have a problem, you let your insurance company's not going to pay. So you have to look for it. now. There's a second brand that you also want to look for besides the Federal Pacific. You can all come over here and take a look. The name, the name is right over here, Federal. Sometimes it's a little easier to see if this is an old one. It says Federal Pacific. Right over there, so take a look for a second. Um, it's Zinco, C-I-N-C-O, I believe is how it's spelled. If you see one of those panel boxes, you gotta replace that as well. Now, you said it's $2,000. At least, now, the problem is, is this bumping around or overhead? Nope, this is overhead. So let's step out here for a second. And I'll show you something. This house, I don't think needs it, but in conjunction with that, that has to have a major permit for electrical permit. You can't touch that without it. A lot of times the service has to be upgraded and I'll explain to you later. So a lot of times and probably the well okay, everybody gets out.
Electricity's coming in, so it's going above the roof. Many times it comes below, like where these, where these wires here are, the cable wires. If that's coming below, right, and there's nothing wrong outside here, and you have 200 amps, so you're not looking through, but sometimes you only have 100 amps, you want to change it to 200 amps, then for sure if you open this up and get a permit, they're going to make you put, um, you have to put that mask. Please be up. careful over there. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm holding it up. You have, to, you, have to, you have to bring it above the roof. And as the pitch comes down, there's a, there's a code how many feet above the roof that, you know, how high you got to go depending on the pitch of the roof. So that would cost you another $1,500 to $2,000. It would be very expensive if you miss this in your, in your estimations. You know, these are your majors, you know, your windows, your roofs, your plumbing, your electric, your AC. These are the things that would cost you a lot of money, the windows. This have to be everything. So if the wires are coming underneath the soffit, this is called the eaves, the soffits. If it's coming underneath it and you're not upgrading anything, and don't worry about it. But if, as soon as you're looking for a, a permit to change that circuit panel box and turn it, change it out here, they, they won't pass it unless you, now you, got, you open up a can of worms, now you gotta bring it to code. Does that ever understand that? So this is very important to watch out for. Now, um, I have the information on the side. I think this was just a pump that I'm standing on top of that must have been for sprinkler system here, right here. Because uh, I think this is city water. Here's something also that's also uh, we see this inside the house a lot. This is called Romex pipe, uh, wiring. Romex wiring cannot be exposed lower than eight feet down. So once it comes down below eight feet, it's got to be in conduit. This is low voltage. That's okay. This is not low voltage. This was put down probably for the pump over here that somebody had a handyman or something just tapped in here and did it. Instead of putting it in the conduit to bring it to the right leg, it's just with a weed whack or whatever. It's, it's not the code. Now, speaking of codes, um, this house. Built in 63. So, anytime you're going for an older home, even if it was built in 2000, you want to see, okay, it says it's a three bedroom, two bath, uh, and, the, and you know maybe a, a screen room has been enclosed. You need to go on the pro property appraisal office and see if there was permits for that. If there's no permits, that doesn't mean sometimes it could be so old they want to, you know, I think most building departments probably go back to about maybe 2000, maybe 1990. So it depends on which one. Prior to that, they'd have to go into archives and find out whether a permit was ever pulled. So if you find permits, then you know the square footage is okay. If you don't find permits, like the house that we're doing in the Berry that I was mentioning to some of you, it was did not have a legal bathroom in there. It was there, but it was done illegally. The carport was finished, but it was done illegally. And they got caught, and they got code violations on it. So you've got to find out the, ma the major. The roof on this here was replaced in 2005, was the last permit on this. Um, they uh, did that, they replumbed it. Uh, they pulled a permit for that too, because I'll show you the paperwork inside. Um, the AC was replaced in 2005, or was the roof? Either one, they're all old, they're over 20 years old, so the roof needs to be replaced, the windows need to be replaced. These windows are original from 1963. They've never been changed. So this would be a major. The, um, the year, how many years does the roof have to be before? Like 15 years? Well, you, you know, to? here in Florida, we have so much heat humidity and rain and so on, but just from the heat, the, the, the architectural shingle, who doesn't know the difference between an architectural and a three-tab shingle, right? No. Okay. All right. So, what's on top of this well roof over here is a three-tab. Yeah, you, three you see the line? Mm -hmm. going vertical. Every other line, they line up. And so, each piece of shingle is three-tab. What's a tab? What's a tab? There is no advantage. That, that okay. is much better. That's architectural. Okay. There is no following line. Well, that's got about 20 to 25 years. That's got about 15, 20 years. So the pricing okay. on that is much cheaper than that, correct? Much, not a much cheaper. Not much cheaper. We well, never, we never so have, we expensive. never have, and we never will ever re re renovate a house to put that on it. We never have in 10 years. Yep. So, there isn't that much of a difference. You can get a 50-year warranty on these architectural shingles. Probably if it was in Kentucky or something where it's not heavy ice and not heavy sun. In Florida, you're not going to get 50 years out. So it would be prorated. Everybody ever say what prorated is? It's a warranty. They deduct how much it's worth, just like the car goes down in value. We'll do the same thing for the roof. But in its it's obviously a lot more, I believe. 
because of protocols. Yeah. Proper. Why are you supposed to be in a in a in a um, I was talking before about underneath this little cap here is where that sacrificial rod is inside of it. But right, let's go inside now and talk. So mechanically, the big things in this house, we know roof, windows, air conditioning, electric. Plumbing is okay. Minor plumbing on these sinks and stuff like that, shallow bodies, that you're gonna change. But the plumbing itself, the pipes. And you see what they did is they came in from wherever the water's coming in outside. And I don't see it here, but it might be over here because there's a, a water conditioning unit. Yeah, but you got water coming in here. Okay, so here's your main water. No, no, no. Well, this is the water coming in. This is so, yeah. So they went up into the attic. So you see they went to the attic, right? And once they went to the attic, some, this is cold water. Somebody switched it around and came down and read for that. We built that, when well, we renovated a two family house about five years ago. And the plumber used low one, he used clear. And he, and he actually crossed the hot with the cold. We had hot water coming out of one of the toilets. So I like blue for cold. Red for, but if you ask your plumber, if he's not going to give you that, that supply house that he uses, doesn't carry it, he's going to give you what the supply house carries. Unless you can pay You pull a permit to replace the hot water. You're here. supposed to, yes. You're and supposed so, to. how did, if we pull a permit, how did this wiring work? Because it wasn't permit, it was no permit for it. <laughs> That's why it wasn't passed. Not only would it not pass, not only would it not pass, it's missing an expansion tank. It's okay. A lot of, these things can blow up and take off through the roof and land on somebody else's house. You're putting a lot of pressure on here. This is a pressure relief valve. So when it builds up to a certain pressure, this is set, I think, at 150 or something like that, 125 pounds, I'm not really sure what it's set at. And it opens up and releases itself. But what if that doesn't open up? This thing's going to expand. And then, so the reason that you have a, a, an expansion tank, that anybody from the north that ever had a hot water heat system, uh, base water radiator, you have expansion tanks. The same thing. So this is not a legal installation. Okay. And so if you're rehabbing it, do you make it illegal? If you're changing, you make. You do anything that. Here's my advice and as a blanket advice, Carol. Anything that requires a permit, if you don't do it, one day they have to come back. And there is no statute of limitations. Right. They have to come back and want you. If somebody going to feel you did something wrong. And if an end buyer is getting an inspector, the inspector. They're going to find it anyway. They're going to find it anyway. Maybe. Okay. Because let's say you did some electrical work. Right? And you didn't hire an electrician. And nobody sees it. But then somebody gets electrocuted down the road and they find out, gee, there was no permit for this. Who did this? Oh, it was good. You're going to get caught. So anything on the outside of the house, the exterior, has to have a permit. It's called structural. Whether it be windows, siding, doors, roof, soffits. And when you get a building permit in Florida, you have to have product information. It is approval for everything in Florida. Before you can get the building permit, you have to submit the product specs, how they're installed, and everything else. Okay, so we don't have pages. Now let's talk cosmetics. So, uh, if you don't have construction knowledge, you want to know what walls can I take down. And then you want to know, gee, is it a bearing wall? Bearing wall means it's supporting the roof structure and the ceiling. If you take it down, you got a problem. So, generally, on a ranch where a style like this was just one way, the ceiling rafters or trusses, and because this was built in the 60s, it may be what's called rafters, where there's just Two, two by tens or two ways coming up to the peak. And at the peak, there's a piece of wood like this that's running this, and each one sits, sits against that, like that coming up, and then from the other side like that. And then there's collar ties going across, that's rafters versus trusses. But either way, they're gonna run in this way, right? So any wall that's running this way can't be bearing, like the wall behind you. That wall can't be bearing, because otherwise it has to be one of the, each, every truss. Right, if the trusses would say 24 inches apart or 16 inches apart, you have to have a bearing wall every 16 inches. How do you decide where the, which way the truss goes? They're going to go from the front of the house to the rear. They're never going to go the length of it. They're going to go the shorter distance. And they can turn on you because if you have an L-shaped house, they'll start turning on you. They'll go the opposite way. Right? So, we know they're going this way. So, walls that are down the center or something, obviously exterior walls, they're definitely bearing up both sides. Um, and there's nothing here. This wall might be. Um, no, it's too, it's too, it's too close, close in. Not necessarily because the, if anything, it would be this one. Right. It would be this one, and maybe not even that. There could be a beam here, and where, behind this gentleman, it could be that right there, because that's about the halfway of the house. So more than likely, it's trusses, and there's nothing a bearing wall in here. But I doubt it. Right. Uh, I'm, 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 and without going up the attic, you just don't know, exactly. because um, you don't, and you don't want to take a guess on it. But uh, assuming, assuming that this was not a bearing wall over here, right? I certainly I know this part right here. This and this is not bearing. 
right? So whether or not when you walk in, you want to see the kitchen or not is one thing, but it would be nice to open the kitchen up to this room because then it opens up the whole area. So if I had to, if this is a bearing wall, worst case scenario, I'm putting a column here, a decorative column that'll support the beam so I can remove the rest of this wall. And then there'll be a beam or a support in there that'll support the columns. You follow what I'm saying? Because now, when you open that room up, and anybody that's gonna come with us to the bearing today, you open up that room, the door, you step into one big room, an open room. That's, that's what's popular today right now. It's one big room with a kitchen, the living room, the family room combination, all one room. That's what we spent. We don't live in that so hot here. We don't live in our bedrooms, right? So we want to do that. Now when we open it up, the kitchen is the most important room in the house. Don't skip in the kitchen. Don't say, oh, gee, I won't put the other counter lights in, I won't put it in the back splash. You gotta put that stuff in. It's like you know, going out and not, you know, shaving or a woman not putting on her makeup or anything. It's just naked, you, you, you're missing it. And, and you're being, you're being penny wise, you pound foolish, whatever that saying goes, because the kitchen's the most expensive room. Counts a, a granite, a, a backsplash will cost you maybe 500 to 700 dollars, depending on what part of your account. And then the only kind of lighting is a couple hundred dollars or less. So it's silly not to do that. But let's take a look in here for a second. that we like to do is these are called soffits above the cabinets. I know that one's got nothing in it. Right? They just did that because otherwise if there was a, if there was air conditioning done or electricity, it, it would continue. So we know you can take that out. And, and more than likely you can take this off if there may be, I know the AC's not near here. They could be running in here, but it's easy fix to move it back out here if it's here coming this way. I would remove all this. It does two things for you. First of all, you're an upscale home where there's nothing in the four or five hundred thousand dollar range. You can either go with 42 inch tall cabinets these, it says that they look like 30 inch. No, it's less than 30. No, that's 30, it's just an optical illusion. Is this higher than that one? I think it is. Oh, that's because they have the range here. Yeah, so th those are 30s. So they come, now today, they, they always, it was standing years ago, it was only 30 inch tall. Now they make 36 inch, they make 42 inch. So 42 inch, this is about a foot, it's actually a little bit bigger. You get much, so if you have less cabinetry space, you can gain more by going taller. Of course, they have to do something to it. But it also looks prettier because even if I went with the 36 inch, right, which would bring me to let's say here, and I put crown molding on it, I'd be to here, and I put the crown molding, put some strip lighting behind it, reflects off the ceiling, that ambient light. This wall would all be gone. I'd have a nice island, right, where Carol and you're sitting, and get a nice big long island right here, a beautiful piece of granite, so it opens up for entertaining and all the rest of that. Everything else will stay where it is. The sink will stay where it is because you always want to put the sink underneath the kitchen. House that we're doing right now, it's offset, right? Um, Huh? Uh, under the window, sorry, right under the window. Um, now, this isn't popular today anymore. We have the cooktop and a separate oven. You know, uh, it's more expensive to go that route. So I probably would not do that either. We put the stove there with the microwave above it. Um, and this doesn't have the dishwasher, yes it does. So you redo the kitchen. on that wall, that way you can possibly put your refrigerator over there in that corner. Right. That way you can open up this corner. Yeah, right. That is what you want to do is you want to open this up. Now let's go to the next most important room, which is the master bathroom. Okay. Chris? Chris. So, all right, so what would you do there, Chris? Did you go, take a look inside that the uh, coffin of a shower. Well, yeah, inside okay. the showers. Take a look and tell me what your solution would be for that. For a skinny little runway model like me, I couldn't even bend over and pick up. Okay, so I what, so what yeah. you're buying this house, Chris. What's that? I said you're buying this house, you're gonna renovate it, what are you gonna do? I would tear out, yeah, tear out this whole wall. Glass sliders. So, okay, so now um, go around. What's behind what's that? Side, what's behind that? That behind blue wall. The shower? The blue wall. No, the wall oh, that you want to open up. I don't know. Maybe the a next closet room. from go the bedroom. What's go that? Take, go take a look. Yeah. Whew. <laughs> yeah. It's good thing I brought two shirts with me today. Ooh, this is going to be trash. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you find, Chris? Really? Nothing. Huh? It looks like there's an actual gap. Like no, there's... that blue wall there is your closet from behind there. Is that the closet? It looks like there's yeah. actually more of it. Oh, well, okay. My closet back up to this. Okay. So, that, so, this closet so you'd have to rearrange that ba bedroom, closet. take the closet out so you can extend the, closet, the bath the yeah. shower, yeah. have it all glass, nice yeah. and glass, only half wall where it comes to the vanity. And the vanity is big enough. That's a five foot vanity. 
It, it, lo it looks confusing, yeah. but trust me. I would put a double so sink in there. Footage. I've never done this before. So. No, it's okay. So I would have double sinks in there because it's wide enough to do it. Where the countertop is, you'd have a little bit of a half wall, maybe up to the height of where the either where the, the tile is now or the or the towel bar, and then from there up it would be glass. What was your name again? JP. JP. JP had a good suggestion. Okay. Matt, since there's so much living space in this house, to actually extend this wall. Oh, out. that's not a bad. What's on the other side of this? The living room. The living room. Yeah. Living room. Living room. Living room. Living room. Oh yeah. We really yeah. Okay. So extend this so wall out, this way, then and you can, can then you can open up this bathroom and make this room bigger and open up the bathroom. If you get the thing at the right price with the correct budget, you can definitely yes. do that. Obviously, all the all the paneling in this you house got to come off. Five hundred bucks. I get this whole wall room for And then push. Wall to put, yeah, put up another one, one at a different price. Yeah. 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 One of the other things that I want you to notice is the sink, the faucet that's in the bathroom. Labor material for that's the called a deck faucet. Meaning that the guts, the valve, everything is sitting on top of it. Let me go in there and point something out. Just to frame the wall. Junk always builds up over here. It's hard to clean in the house, right? Especially with the kitchen sink. But if this, 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 so this is a dead do all the extra trim. It's not even attractive to do it. It's 80 centimeters. It's just the handles that come from the valve. And the valve is underneath the sink. Sorry. Sorry. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? So what you should put in is 8 inch center. That's a 4 inch center. 4 inch center means it's 4 inches from the center of the hot water to the center of the cold water. 8 inches is just the opposite. Center of the hot water, center of the cold water is 8 inches. But the body sits underneath. It's a little more labor to assemble it, but it's so much more attractive, so much easier to keep it clean because you just have three things sticking up. You have hot, cold, and the spout. And much, especially, you get two, two, uh, two nice uh, sinks in there, uh, do the gorgeous in there. That can become, and if we took the suggestion of JP bringing it out bigger, right. then you, 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 you can, can, can sleep. But if you didn't do that, out here and then you could make them. Nice and the same thing in the whole bathroom. You just got that. You can't change the size of it, but you can make it look gorgeous. Right. If you were going to keep this, if you weren't going to expand the size of the trim, you're going to keep it like it is, right? And do I try to the shower. My question though is about the door. So would you get rid of a swinging door and maybe do like a pocket barn? door? A, no. Well, a barn door. No, 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 a barn, barn door. That's a barn door. Yeah. To, yes. save, now, to save space. Now, I, I, I would do a barn door here. Yes. Depending on how small that room becomes, I may take that closet out and build it and frame out a bump out closet into that bedroom. That way you can actually make your shower bigger. Right. Does everybody understand? Come over here. Are you saying bump out to the exterior? No. Paint this white or paint it the same color as the wolf room? This? Yeah, I believe it's right. No, same color as the wolf. 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 Same that doubles the price on it. Everybody thought we're nuts, especially the house in DeBerry. Not that you know, DeBerry, people that say they just don't know about DeBerry. There are a million dollar homes or two million dollar homes in DeBerry. <clears throat> but this house is gonna go for about 325. Let 325. Tony know that both tracks are messed up. Yes, I think he knows. Okay. Yeah, because they gotta go back in there. No, they're not, they're not connecting the back. One All right, and the wiring. So let's talk about wiring. what we did to this house to start with, how we increased it. All right, guys, this front door, this would be about where I'm standing right now. There's a wall going from here, and then it turned and went this way. Uh, I promise you. I knocked it down. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. there, there, there was a bench I should sit on outside. outside. You still had to cover it. Oh, the wall went from here to here. The window with a wall, block wall, and the front door was right here. I personally knocked it down myself. So there was a wall that came out this way, and the windows, and then the door was over here. So there was a little patio. So when you came in, when you opened the door, you would have to. Did we get a permit to do that? Yes, we got permits to, to read. Everything's permitted. Everything's permitted. We made it. Redo the yeah, front. Anything exterior, you have to get a permit. So, this was permitted a little bit. Then the next thing that we did is there used to be, that was the carport. Behind Priscilla, there was an entrance right there to go into a back room over here, which is where the bathroom is now. You could not go from this room to the bathroom. This was the carport. It was lower the concrete as they usually are. Whether you have a garage or you have a carport, it's always at a lower height so the gasoline doesn't roll, if you have a leak, doesn't roll back into the house and burn the house down. In the north, so the ice and the rain when the troops off your car doesn't roll in the house. So we had to pour seven inches of concrete from there down to six inches down to the other end so that it was level. No, it's actually four inches on that side and eight inches on that side. Oh, the other way, right, right, the other way. Right. Uh, so now we have the vinyl luxury pine flooring evenly going right through the whole house. So that door was already there, but obviously we created nice jams for it and everything. We closed that up 
and move the air, air conditioner there. That used to be a passageway where the, where the return grill is. That's now right behind that, you'll see when we go in the master bedroom, watch your head, Chris, is the, is the air handler, right? So we closed it off, and obviously the, the air conditioning system used to be on the outside wall, but then the return air vent wasn't good. But now we've got the return air vent, and the most important part, right, to, to get it back in. Now come in here. So the wall behind me, this was the carport, where uh, Richie's filming from, right there, that was a concrete wall, you could not walk through to the bathroom. Eric literally made a video of that, he took that concrete wall out. This wall here was about right about here, and this was just a little dingy little bedroom from that wall right behind Richie to me. Which is a little, and it was a handicapped uh, young lady about in her 30s living in a wheelchair that lived in this room. Uh, and there was a ramp, obviously, for her to get back up to there because it was lower. That wall outside, the outside of it was drywall. It was a Mickey Mouse. It was code violations. One of the code violations is they, re, they converted the carport to a livable area. You know, it wasn't a code, so that was a violation. And the back room that we now turned into a laundry room had a dirt floor to it. They had built that. At one time, this was owned by the father or the grandfather. It passed through the different hands over the years, and they had a hot tub out there, and uh, so they built that extension without permits or anything. So, and then, the, and then they installed windows in the house. This is a brand new window. They're all brand new windows. But the windows that they put in were used windows from the house next door <laughs> that when that person changed their windows, they said, can I have your windows? <laughs> and as soon as I approached the house, the front window of the living room, I saw it sticking out. I literally could stick my finger in there and, and pry it. They were installed properly. So, code violation. And then, and then where we're standing, right, where I'm standing right now, in front of this door, was a pile, it looked like a junkyard. It was just a pile of junk. It was junk all over this property. So obviously that was a red flag for code violations. And they noticed that this was enclosed. All we got to do is put a property appraisal. Said, nope, it's not an enclosed carport. Code violations. They went up to fifteen thousand dollars code violations on the house. So when we went down to the code to the uh, code enforcement, uh, there had been many other buyers looking for this house, and they all backed out. They backed out because there was forty thousand dollars in mechanical liens against it. We were going to pay. I got rid of those. There was a code violation for fifteen thousand dollars, and they got a ton of work. Right, and it was a small house. It was only a two bedroom, one bath. Even though there was a bathroom back there, there was no shower. No, there was no shower. It was just the, the toilet and a vanity. I don't remember showering. No, there wasn't. Because right to the shower now was the wa was the washing machine. So when we went down to let's go before we go buy this house, we had to go speak the code violation and see what what it's all about, what has to be done. So she says, well, I said, oh, well, we're going to do that. I said, well, our plans is exactly we we would convert this, make it legalized, we would fix that back there, so change the windows, in fact, we're going to change the roof, we're going to change everything. She said, well, if you do all that, we don't have a problem, we can get rid of it. I said, well, how come can we lower the fine down to? I said, because we, we won't buy the house just like all the other investors, as you know, backed out. I knew there was a sore thumb to you, uh, and they all backed out because the numbers didn't work. So I know you guys are negotiable, what we can do? I mean, I know usually customer is 50%. I said, but that won't work for $7,500, what can you do? And then we'll take care of it, you'll be, you'll be happy, we'll make a beautiful home. She says, how's 2800 sound? I said, that sounds all right. From the time we went to the public meeting, and, and when the, the, the permits usually, I mean, the, the code violation stops in almost every county as soon as you get a building permit. Or you, if it's not for a per permit, like cleaning up the junk, they just clean the junk up. But this is what I need the permit. So as soon as you pull the permit, the, code, the, the, the fine stopped, and then we had to go to a public hearing for code violations, which was only two people there, and she said, $2,300. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the check. <laughs> now, when we closed on this house, it was $15,000 held back from the seller, held in escrow at the title company to pay for those fines because we didn't know what the fine would be. And the deal was <laughs> if we got it down to $10,000, she'd get five back. If we got it to $5,000, she'd get ten back, right? So then things are going along, and all of a sudden, closing, she had to come up, she wasn't getting a penny. And she didn't sell this house by December, I think it was 20th of last year. She was going to prison for 10 years. She needed to pay her, she had fines. She had already been in jail, in prison for three years. She did some fraudulent. Uh, a lot of fraudulent things she did. She uh, bought a house in Deltona that somebody recommended that it was in foreclosure. She was supposed to bring it current. She didn't. She started renting it out, which was equity screaming, which is against the law. She got arrested for it because one day the sheriff's department knocked on the renter's door, said, Hey, here's a foreclosure. The renters, they don't know nothing. They don't know about the real estate. They freaked out. They called this. They called the attorney. They called the prosecutor to find out that it would be illegal. She got arrested. And a couple other things. And they got giving her an extension. They said, Fine. The judge said, you don't have to pay by December 20th. It was like $24,000 or something like that. You're going to prison for 10 years. 
So she was up against the wall, and we had like about eight days left or something like that, or 10 days. It was really close to it. Um, and so when we did all the cut stuff, all of a sudden some other lean came up, and it was about another $4,500. And that's why she wasn't going to get any of closing. All she was going to get was that what was left over from the, the code violation if I reduced it. So we made a deal with this and listen, you, you, you're negative. We'll lay out the extra money that we shouldn't have to. It's going to cost me now. I wouldn't normally have to go get permits to a fix and flip because I don't usually do structural things. So that's costing me more money. So it cost me $1,000 for an engineer. And they, I said, I'll, uh, you, you waive the $15,000 because we don't even know if I'll get the reviews. And I'll put the extra money up. So the closing cost went from 10000 to like almost 15000 But we got 100% financing on this. We just had to pay for the closing cost. Um, Oh, where's Bill? Bill didn't hear anything. He's right here. Oh, he just got here. Oh, he just got here. Okay. Come I was on. at the other house. They had a better presentation going on. What? <laughs> <laughs> I say it was the other presentation. What presentation? The other house. What other house? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so just telling the story about how we got to this house. So then where did I just go? Oh, so so we said we'll put the extra money up. So now she's getting nothing. She just didn't want to go to prison. She was living with her niece, who was a handicapped girl, and then either her son or her daughter, they got divorced or whatever, and she was taking care of a year and a half old baby. And so, you know, she, it was fright that what's gonna happen to the family tonight. She goes to prison, who's gonna take care of these other two people? And the husband, he was a waste. And so anyway, uh, so that's how we did it, and then we got the balance of that money back, but then we went from a normal uh, flip that we figured that, because originally when we bought this house, we, the, the, the Eric, Eric owns this, the comps, 255, is what we felt we could sell it for for a two bedroom, one bath there? Yep, two one. Two no, one. If we kept it as a two one, about a thousand square feet, we could probably sell it for two fifty five. Well, I think it was seven seventy to start with. It was seven seventy, but we were going to make it about a thousand square feet. We were. How were we going to do that? By right. making this a bedroom. Okay. Um, right. So we were. We were going to keep it three one. We were going to keep it. We were going to keep it three one. We were going to make this bedroom legal. Right. Okay. So we we're going to get rid of the bathroom. We weren't going to do the extra bathroom. We we're right. just going to have three three one. So anyway, two one three one that would have been two fifty five. So our lender, uh, it's a husband and wife. Uh, he's an engineer. The lender, the giant, to like she's six two or six three or six, <laughs> six seven. I'm telling you, twelve people. <laughs> I'm twelve people. You gotta look up to them. And so uh, she does the lending, hundred percent lending, within an hour of yeah. a, a low veto. Right. Although she just sent us an email that they cut back because they're afraid that the economy is dropping sales. And there's, there's an article that came out two days ago. But anyway, to bear that's not the case because there's no inventory here. And so I know this will sell soon as we on the market. But um, the husband came out to do the inspection to see what we were buying. And he's the one who said, I would get rid of that you know, jog in the front and make it work. It would gain that and definitely push that wall out and, and, you know, and put another bathroom in. And so we took his advice. I mean, so our re rehab jumped. And we didn't know that it was termite infested the house. Not live ones, but that damaged. So when we started taking off the doors in the bathroom over there to change them and the jams, the jack studs and your king studs, which is when you frame, they were disintegrated. And the more we took off, and then well, um, that back wall, which is the bathroom wall, which is now the kitchen with the cabinets, same thing. And the further we went, and then they started opening the ceiling, and said, oh my God. And then somebody opened the attic, and the main beam that goes behind you to the other wall, that was just hopeless, that's what we have a clear span, was destroyed. <laughs> so now we ended up, so every piece of drywall that you see in this house, other than the back two bedrooms, didn't exist. We took it down to the bare studs, to concrete, and then so we rewired the house, we reframed the house inside. Um, Plumbing-wise, there was a bathroom back there, as I said, there was a toilet and a sink. It went out the back, the septic was in the front, and the sink went to a dry well, which is just a hole in the ground with gravel, and the, and the toilet was running around, but it was just not gonna make it. So, and then the same thing with that, and then when the plumber came to do that, he said, you got cast iron. So what we decided to do was, and I'll show you pictures of it. We cut, we put the top, before we poured the concrete on top of this, from back there, we, we had a guy come in with a concrete sewer and he cut the concrete about this wide, nice, nice clean cut, and there was a trench right between my legs, and we ran brand new plumbing out and out to the septic. And we put new septic fields in the septic had it clean, it was okay. So brand new waistlines, which is a flip, you don't normally do waistlines. We talked at the other house about doing the water lines, but we did both in this house. So this house literally is a brand new house. We start outside, the roof has been replaced, the windows have been replaced. I've now uh, parge coated and stucco the outside of the house. New framing with hardy board, concrete boarding over here because we moved it out. Windows have been replaced, the wiring has been replaced, the insulation has been replaced, all brand new drywall, brand new texture. So everything's brand new in the house. Brand new air conditioning system. 
brand new kitchens and bathrooms. The only thing that's new, it's almost easier to say what's not new, and that's the septic tank and the framing <laughs> of the house. So that's what we did. And then there was a wall here that went straight across. To show my eyes off. Um, so there was a wall here that went across, and it was a concrete wall. And you can come in and you can see the remains of it, that this here is actually where the wall was. And how that was supported, I don't know, but I don't think it would be, but there was a concrete wall there, and there's a video of Eric smashing it down with the, um, and so the AC is now over here, which I showed you guys in the, in the living room where the vent is, but it used to be over here. This closet didn't exist, it was just a teeny little thing. This closet behind it didn't exist, and then there was a wall here. She had, oh, there was a, a, a freestanding, like, closet, you know, like a piece of furniture that she used. Mm -hmm. So, this is all new, the back here. So, this was the washer dryer area. So now we turn to the roof. This will be glass on September 5th. The glass doors are coming here. Um, Plumbers coming. Um, and what I did was, this was interesting, what I did in here. And I just finished this yesterday. <clears throat> so, the design of this, I, I, I say, oh, it's okay. that Eric really handled the whole thing. My background is plumbing, you know. And he does really good job, but he handles basically 99% of his stuff. So the thing that we missed is the shower body is too far in. If you stand here, how do you turn it on without getting soaked and wet? Right? So, and then the other mistake that we didn't catch is the thing is look how this wall is it's at an angle here. That one was at an angle. And the guy's about to put all, oh, excuse me, he's about to put all this tile on. I said, wait a second. How the heck am I going to put a door on here with a hinge? I said, that's got to be squared off. So I'm, you guys frame this wall. And what happens is in new construction, the block, the carpenters blame the, the block guy for being out of slate, right? Then the, the drywallers blame the framers, you know, the painter blames the, the, the taper, everybody puts their weapon, so they don't appreciate who's next and thinking ahead. When you get a contract who thinks of the other stuff, the stuff ahead of them, or you've coordinated and had a group meeting in the beginning that everybody knows what's going to go on. So this was missed, but it, 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 it's working. So the door's going to hinge here, there's going to be a, a solid piece of glass about like this, and the door will go like this and totally open, or it'll swing in if you want. But so I still didn't like it, so I then went and I said, okay, and I bought a, normally when you get one of these things, right, you either change it, which is what I'm doing, because I put a separate, the way to have this been done, there should have been two valves here, yeah. one for the handheld, one for the shower. We did an historic home in, uh, four years ago, so some of you might know, we did the oldest house in the city, the only house built in 1870. I did that in every one of the bathrooms. I mean, I really decked it out. <clears throat> so I searched around, I bought this separately, right? Shut off valve. And then I got a diverter here, shut off valve for the shower head. So you leave the shower head off, right? You can leave this off or grab this first and, and control it, turn the water on. Now you can step in and right, until you get ready. So there's a, a rain shower head going in here. But I had to go and buy these chrome 90 degree and these nipples. I just put this on yesterday, I just fitted it. Because if I didn't, if I put this here, this would hit the ceiling. And, and I, it's as it is, I hope this is going to meet code as an LED because you, you can't have electricity in the bathroom in here. Unless it's uh, waterproof. Yeah, this is. Go. Who's going? Thank you. Okay. Okay, Carol, have a good day. <clears throat> so, anyways, so that's what's happening there. Remember in the other house, I was talking about eight inch centers and not using a deck mounted? These are eight-inch centers. See how that is so much prettier, so much easier to keep it clean, you know, the junk that usually, if this was a deck mounted, that you get corroded over here. But it looks prettier, right? <clears throat> and this here um, is a, uh, this is career marble that you're looking at, right? These are porcelain sinks, and I always like to get the white with that. And I wanted to go, as you can see, with the theme of the gray theme throughout the whole house, right? Um, and so now we have two mirrors that are going to go up here. These lights have to be reversed. Actually, the electrician put them in the wrong. They're pointing like that. And so actually, that helps me because they won't protrude below that, which allows me to get this up even higher. All right, so it goes something like that. So I went with, usually I don't do chrome, but there was, um, we decided to go with chrome in this house. We did something like that because I wanted to do more of the modern look, you know? So you can see we did a lot of work to this house. The same thing in the hall bathroom. We had to put, cut the concrete right through. And, uh, and now I'll show you what it looks like. Questions? Uh, my yeah, it would have been easier to show them. Did home, you, how fast can you get to the videos of the trenches and stuff? Real quick, I got put it down. Huh? Aren't, are, are they on your uh, Facebook page? Not no. yet, no. Oh. The trenches we're looking for? Yeah. Drop. So going all the way around the house, and can cut it. Mm -hmm. I needed, I didn't have enough drop, is what that's called. So I knew that it had, but I had the plumbing background, but still even you, know, you bring a GC in, and, and, and obviously we had to be a licensed plumber to do this, licensed electrician, licensed air conditioning company. 
Um, I pulled the permit GC. I get I get builders that qualify me, so I pulled the permit itself, uh, which is very easy to do. Uh, you pay somebody five hundred thousand dollars, fifteen hundred maximum, and they go and, let, and authorize you as a signature, almost like a power of attorney, to go and, and sign the, uh, the patentry and building permits and get the permit. So and then you hire a licensed electrician, licensed plumber, and that's how we proceed to do it. Questions? Are you a licensed general contractor? No. No, I built over 200 homes, but it was in New York when I built. And then uh, knocked the wall down myself as well. But here you can see, um, here's the wall. The front door's already gone, I've already removed it. And here's the uh, window wall, which is right about here. What else can I see? That was originally the carport, right? That was the carport. Illegally enclosed, we pulled the permit to make it legal. So when it's oh, um, this one was too wide point either. Yeah, we're going to be proposing the door. Foot no, it was one one framed in. I think there was a window there because there was concrete the block. Yeah, oh, right, right now. Eric, what was that? This there was concrete block about a foot up or so, maybe eighteen inches, sixteen inches. Yes. So and this was just framed in. We said, and then when I went outside, I could tell that there used to be a sliding glass door because it was Mickey Mouse framed in. I said we need to open it up. So we're pouring a pad out there. We're going to pour a concrete pad. 16 feet out to the edge of the building, uh, out to the 16 feet that way. Okay. Now we have somebody who wants to set up for that, but they want to go to the building, they want to make it bigger than they can. So where was your egress? Egress, there was, uh, how did you get out? 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 And then you can go out that door didn't even exist. It was just wide open. You're doing cold calling or you're doing ringless messages, text messaging. There's all kinds of people with their marketing, Facebook ads, regular just a Facebook post. They all work, right? Or you work with a broker. And when you get the price from the broker um, or a wholesale, and that's what a lot of people do. So when we get a, a wholesale, which this that's how we got this house. We're on an email list for a bunch of wholesalers. This actually was a text message. This was a text message that you got for, for that this was available, and we live in DeBerry, we live 10 minutes from here, so of course we're interested. So Eric, let's go take a look at it. They were asking 120,000. Eric made the appointment, uh, the, the wholesaler couldn't meet us, so he decided to let us meet the homeowner. That was his first mistake. <laughs> so we came here, and it's like a nightmare, and then she starts telling me about the liens and this and that, and I said, oh, this is very involved. Um, and I said, do, do you mind? And I said, you know, and you could tell she, she was a chatty type, but very friendly, very nice lady. Um, you know, she broke the laws and stuff like that. I didn't mean she wasn't nice, she just did something she should have done. And uh, so I said, do you mind me telling me what they were offering to buy, you know, pay you for this house? She says, $87,000. And I said, hmm. So they wanted 120, <laughs> and I wouldn't have paid 120 anyway, the numbers didn't work. So we went back home, and I said, do you mind showing me the contract? I looked at the contract and everything. I see all these things that just weren't right, but okay. So Eric calls them back and says, 95,000. And they say, uh, we'll call you back in a few minutes. They get back and we'll text them, said 101. And I said, no, Eric, just tell them 95. They said, just tell them, forget it. No, no problems, thank you for the opportunity. We'll catch you on the next one. We can't go a penny over 95. And about five minutes later, they called back and said, we'll take it. Because <laughs> they only had about eight days or 10 days left. They, were, they had already gone for God knows how many um, uh, other sales that fell apart. So the problem was here in July of last year, the bathroom over here, when we bought this house, the drywall was off over here, and it was a Mickey Mouse. I mean, the kitchen cabinets was like, it was like hodgepodge. But they had the, the pipe to the bathroom broke, and so they had a flood. And so then mold was something, and they called one of those mold remuneration companies. Now here in Florida, we all know about, and we've heard about the high uh, insurance rates and why we're losing the insurers. A lot of that has to do with the roof is moving for us. Because these roofers come around, yeah, the developers are knocking the door. Hey, we're doing so and so's house. Hey, you know, we could probably get you a free roof. You mind if I go up and take a look at some storms here? And they go back and they, and you, they, they have these uh, software, these programs. They can go back and tell every day there was a hailstorm, and then they go up there and they look for a certain you know, one foot pad of how many things. Oh yeah, we we'll get you. And they do what's called substitution of the insurance. So basically, they're assigning their rights to the insurance claim to the contractor. And the contractor says, listen, I'll, I'll negotiate, I'll fight, I'll have to sue the con your insurance company, it won't cost you anything but your deductible. You know, whatever we get, we get. And so they did that. And the insurance company would say, well, this is a fly-by-night company, what it was. They weren't, they were licensed. And they were licensed in the mold remuneration, they were licensed in the removal, they were licensed as a general contractor, but one was the brother, the brother, and then they opened up a contract co company and closed it down. And so I looked, started doing the research on it, and I said, wait a second, the lien is in one name, 
the contract that was in a different name. You can't have a contract and lien the property that never did the work, right? And then I go look at, and then I go to the office. Whoever has the white truck here, the maverick, and the motorcycle I need you to move, they're going to start doing the front yard with the bobcat. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to start the front yard with the bobcat. Get that within 48 hours to get that person to buy a house with no money down. They don't have any money, but they don't want it. So this is a claim to fame. Well, I started in 1981, so I'm an originator too, right in the beginning. I took my very first no money down class in 1981. I was living in New York, but there was a, I was visiting folks, at, a, a relatives in Fort Lauderdale, and on comes the TV, uh, no money down, you don't need credit, you don't need, hey, that sounds like me, let's go. So I was only in my 20s, so let's go, let's take a look at this, right? So uh, anyway, um, I took that, but then, I uh, became a builder. Uh, I bought my first house in 1981. Interest rates were 18%. Um, I did a very great value at 10%. But then in 83, I became a builder and built a little bit too many homes. But Ron Legrand started in 1982. He started teaching in 84. And he's taught probably 700,000 students. Uh, Ted Thomas is a good friend. Of he's also he's probably in his 80s. But he's the originator that taught everybody's doing tax links. There's nobody more educated than him. I guarantee that those people are. So I could always make the same statement that anybody that teaches real estate either learned directly from Ron or from somebody that Ron taught. Anybody ever heard of fortune builders, Ted and Merrill? They're huge, uh, and, and they're one of the largest. Well, they learned from, uh, Ted used to be a football player. He's one of the, the largest marketing group across the United States. They come down many different cities at the same time. They go up on TV, come down for a free three hours, and at that they sell you $1,200 for a free day. Before you know it, you're up selling $45,000. Um, and so then, but they were taught by Ron, by Robin Thompson. Robin Thompson was the queen of rehab. Robin Thompson lives in Florida. She has 68 acre horse farm. She breeds uh, Kentucky Derby uh, thoroughbreds and races them there. And she also has a 5,000 square foot mansion in Connecticut. And she actually crossed her and she didn't want to do it. So uh, it doesn't matter who, everybody know who Pace Morby is? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right? He learned from Ron Legrand. Everybody learns from Ron Legrand. Eric and I, if you go on YouTube, you put in Ron Legrand's name, Oh, hundreds and hundreds, probably way more, I'll guarantee there's more videos. Well, Facebook's pretty active lately, but I still bet there's probably more YouTube videos on Ron than there is from Pace. Could you spell his last name? Yep. E-G-R-A-N-D. Lee Grant, Ron. Lee Grant. So, but he also seven years ago did a documentary on his life and also about real estate. And he invited Eric and I and my wife and my daughter to his 50th wedding anniversary. So we went there and, that, and then that's when they asked us if we would speak. Out of about 700,000 students that he's taught, Eric and I are the only ones in this documentary. So you go on YouTube and you put in Ron Grand Documentary, which is doc, it'll come up and um, um, I think it's 10 minutes and 20 seconds, all of a sudden you'll see Barry and Eric Sandhouse, and we have the only speaking part, and there are many uh, students. Uh, there are the students in there. a 30 minute video, we have about a three minute slot, so that's pretty cool. And then they came out and they visited us, and actually all the voiceover that we did was in the hotel room there the night of the party, we were sitting on director chairs and we were asking us questions when we were done. They said, gee, you guys were really smooth. We were the last ones. And Eric says, well, what do you mean? Well, we said, well, we can't use it. We don't think we can use anybody else if they were just like Carl. Yeah. And then Eric walked up and said, well, first he found out that they actually were from Winter Park and also California. And he said, hey, if you want to come down and film me and come to our office, you're welcome to. Three months later, they contacted him. They came out, came to our office. So if you watch the video, you'll see us talking, sitting up both of our desks. And then we went to a, a, a house that was staged and then one that was in construction. But all the talking was done in the hotel room. It was really cool. But anyway, we're getting up. So let's talk about how you start off with a fix and flip. <clears throat> so the first thing you do is you get a lead. Everything starts with leads. If you don't have leads, and you don't have enough leads. If you really want to make this a business and not a hobby or, or a sideline or a side hustle, and you want this to become the main life stream for you and, and have it where your passive monthly income exceeds your monthly bills, that means that you got pocket money and you never have to worry about paying your bills because set it and forget it, it's already coming in, then you build your wealth. So having income is really great. So um, one of the things that you're gonna do first is is get on a wholesaler's list or whatever. So whoever has you find the lead, because if you, if you, if you, I just took a class uh, two weekends ago. Hold on a second, pause the video for a second. So, um, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that you do, if it looks like it's something decent you might be interested in, uh, I like to go to the property appraisal office. So, and Seminole County actually has it where they'll email the property card. So everything that I printed right here on the house that we were just at um, can be sent as an email to you, which I have. So the first thing it tells you is that you want to look at permits that were pulled and the, and the, and the building uh, information. So the building information, it'll talk about fixtures. 
in bathrooms. They don't say it's one bathroom or two baths. They go by fixtures. Mm -hmm. Fixtures is the sink is a fixture, bathtub's a fixture, toilet's a fixture. So a normal bathroom would be a three fixture. So if you have six fixtures, you got two bathrooms. Right? So that's how you read that. Um, and so this one says uh, three bedrooms, two baths. Actually, this one says both, but then it says six fixtures. Because what if it was a half bath? Right? But then it should say that. But all right. So yeah. So you can look at that. Then I go to the permits. <coughs> oh, did I not print? Uh, I must have left that piece of paper at home. I know I printed it. Uh, let's see here. But I printed it, and, and the only things it showed me was the uh, they never it, the floor plan and the size of that, which is the most important thing I'm looking for. Is the same. The footprint. I'm looking for the footprint that they didn't enclose any grow in you know part of the house and make it livable without getting permission for it. There was nothing on that. So then the, what I did see was the permits, like when the roof was replaced, when the plumbing was replaced, and when the roof was replaced the first time. I think it was replaced in 94. Don't forget the house was built in the 60s. Right? So it was replaced in 94, and then again in 2005. And I think 2001 is when the AC was there. So I checked that out because we want to make sure that you're not buying something that's illegal. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's also a negotiation for you because if the wholesaler or anybody's trying to sell it to you and they're saying it's 1,800 square feet, it's and the league was only 14 or 12 yeah. or whatever, you got some required to go. All right, so the next thing I do is, like I said, I like to go to Zillow. And on Zillow, you put the address in and it will give you, you bring up the house and then you, you can X the house out and there's a drop down menu and I'll put what's sold on that. So there's three choices, sold, for sale, or rent. So you can see what's renting in the area, you can see what was sold and what's for sale. Um, on Zillow, and almost everybody lists on Zillow because today, when you put it in a multiple listing, it automatically goes there. Right. When you take a, when somebody takes a listing, it goes to like 20 different websites. So it's going to be on there if it's listed. Um, so I go in there, and then when you close out the, the house, there'll be a map of the subdivision, and you go to satellite view, which is usually what it's on at that point, which means that you can see the grass and the houses and everything. You see the lot lines, and there'll be a yellow box in every house that's sold. Then you put your mouse over it, it won't tell you when it's sold or how much it's sold for. Uh, I think it just does, it might tell you how much it sold for, and it tells you whether it was a 3 2 or something like that. So then you click on it, and then you get that. So, comps. How do you do comps? So, I, I was able to print, and then they, on, on the property appraisal office, it had comparable sales. So, I printed that, but they, and they went, and it gives you the distance, so they picked out, but I think they picked out three really compatible ones that have the exact same. No, actually, okay, so the house we were at today was 1,670 square feet, and the two comps that they picked, one is 1,707, so it's only 37 feet big, a big deal, 1,775 and 1,635, so really good comps as far as that. Yes, Richie? You got that from the property appraiser's office on, the, on their website? Yes. Directly from the county? Directly from Seminole County, for the house okay. we went to today. Right. This is the specs for the house today. This is the property card for the house today. You can see that's the, the house. All right. All right. So on there, there's drop-down menus for permits, this, that, and everything else. So the one that I went to is compatible sales. So I like to see what what have they sold for, uh, because like the house we went to today, the broker says three fifty. We know that was in the work, but around the corner, the house sold. So comps need to be sold. The ones that you use need to be no more than six months away. In other words, they were sold within the last six months. But if you pick three of them, and all three were six months old. By the time you renovate yours, when you sell your house, those can't be used. The bank would send an appraiser out. The appraiser must use the closest one. He's got to find one, if possible, that's sold within 90 days. And if the house next door sold for like 30000 less, but a um, quarter of a mile away, there's two that match the price you want, uh, he's got to take the closest one. So you got to be careful. And that's one of the things I was talking about earlier. Um, so about, you want to look at the comps in the area and make sure that you're not overbuying for something. Correct. Or what you mean to sell it for. Now, if you're buying it for a buy and hold, that's different. If you're buying it for a rental or Airbnb, student housing, like we bought a bunch of houses in the land for that. So you're out, you know, what you're going to use it for, highest and best is a different formula of what you want, you know. But if you're looking for a flip, then, and you're going to make it the prettiest house in the market, then you have to see what the highest house sold for. And if it was six months ago, depending on the market right now, they're saying, Houses are about to start coming down. They haven't, that has not happened in DeBerry yet because of supply and demand. Orlando, the supply this month uh, for August, I believe, went up. I mean, it, it increased. So that means houses aren't selling. And that means the prices are coming down. What do you consider the maximum amount of inventory months that you would look at and say a normal, it's a, a normal tighter climate. Market. A normal climate is four months worth of inventory. There are no houses were ever listed. 
that you'd be able to sell for four months, have a house, and then there'd be nothing to buy. But so it seems like just about every county's got different. Just about two to three months. I mean, not even four months inventory right now. Right. So it's orange is changing. Right. right but that, that's just a generalization. All right. But when they do that, they don't take a town. They take the they take the city. They would take the, the MLS, which would be cover Osceola, uh, Lucia, uh, Orlando, uh, Orange, Seminole, Orange. Seminole Orange. Orange. So that's how they're going to take. They're not going to just take. A, they're not going to say Winter Park, or they're not going to say you know a College Park. You know, they're not going to do that. So that's, that's that's individual. And those are days on market because now you can drill down to the actual neighborhood, and there should be days on market. That's the common. If the days on market is seventy or sixty or thirty, and you're at ninety, you're overpriced. Because the only reason something doesn't sell, the only reason, I don't care if it's halfway burnt down, I don't care if it's an environmental issue. What? It's a number. That's just overpriced. If you lower the price, somebody will buy it. That's the only reason. So what that also tells you is something very interesting, whether it be commercial or residential, what does it tell you about the seller if it's been on the market forever? They don't need the cash or they're out of state or they're yeah, unable. That's no, no, that's the first one. They don't need the cash. Because yeah. if they needed the cash, they would have taken all the local orders they can't do. They're not, they're, they're not under the gun with what we call some motivation, like a foreclosure, you know, ta whether it be taxes, HOAs, banks, uh, divorce, whatever it may be, they don't have some deadline, they don't do something by it. So their their motivation is greed. They like the guard brother, make me a price, but offer I can't do it. So one of the things that you should, should know about that way, that they would be an, an excellent person then for terms. If you were looking to do something for terms creatively, if you wanted to buy it on monthly payments, they're they, they don't need the money, so maybe they would do it. They're what's more interested in paying them their dollar amount that they want. They may not want to carry the, the note on it any longer, but they don't, they're not going to get it. Right, they may not have a note. It could be paid in full. You don't know what the situation is. Well, there's taxes and all that stuff and maintenance on it, but they may right. not want to, like you said, they may be more willing to do something creatively. Right, and it depends on what it is, whether it was the house they were living in or was it a rental. If it's a rental, it's even better because they're already, they don't need the cash to go live someplace else. They're already living someplace else, and they're accustomed to getting payments. Matter of fact, one of the best leads is not for sale by the owner, it's for rent by the owner. And you call the houses for rent. Hi, my name is Barry. Calling about that house is still for rent over on Elm, Elm Street. Yes, it is. Great. Hey, what's your name? Oh, my name's Chris. Hey, Chris, nice to meet you. Have you got a few moments so I can get some information on that? Yes, great. Hey, Chris. You guys, are you ready to order? Yes. You forgot about us? Well, just kidding. I'm, so I'm so sorry. That tip just went from $1,000 down. <laughs> that, that could almost like, hurt. You know that big room in the back? Yeah, yeah, random people. Like, oh, there's something. That's cool. I just had a long weekend. But thank you. Okay. Welcome back. <laughs> thank you. Well, Party's already over. Wait a minute. I don't okay. know. We're hungry. Okay, we'll start down there in the corner. Yeah. Is it all going to be on one check? No. Oh, it's up two and one and. Okay. So. So, you done set us all up with them, right? like, <laughs> what I'm wanting to do um, with the tax fee uh, part. Of the trees, no um, and I've and been doing like this it? now for uh, quite, quite a few months. Um, basically, pretend to buy options. options. Like I told you, my modal factor is 0.69 minus repairs mm -hmm. would be my max bid on the property. And I'm pretty okay. successful. Okay. I win about 60 to 70 percent right, of some you? homes sell for a price. hell of a lot more than I think they should price. go for. Right. Okay. But the ones that blew me away was uh, the Pablo Pinier. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you haven't bought any of the deeds yet? I bought the deeds yet. I'm about to. Right. Um, I I got to I got to line up my attorney to quiet the title. I got to line up. Um, uh, uh, I've got my trust and title people lined up. Who do you use for trust? Uh, the the trust and title. Uh, I have them saved on my uh, Google right. Chrome. Okay. I want to get. I'm terrible um, with names. No problem. No problem. Medium. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get. Um, I mean, the name wouldn't uh, matter for now. You know, what's that? I guess the name wouldn't, French French wouldn't French matter French for French now. Of course. Right. Just coming back down to the deal. Uh, and some home fries. French fries and a little potatoes. Home little potatoes. Uh, an English muffin. And orange juice. Thank you. And can you change mine to home fries, by the way? Uh, yeah, I would be on one check for three of us. That's going to mess the whole thing up. Mm -hmm. We'll see what happens. We're going to be getting lost with the ones. And everybody's just going to be like, oh, no. Yeah, we'll see what happens. So I'm still trying to line up a few things, including 
people that might want to buy the properties right, that that's what I'm I get. You get right, we'd be interested in buying them, obviously. Yeah, because yeah, like I told the two houses I could have picked up for basically forty thousand dollars and change, and they were two thousand twenty one bills, no liens at all, brand new. Didn't have to do a damn thing. I'd have sold them for a hundred. So where and where were these in Cortland? You said Clay County. Clay County. Clay County. Uh, there was one in Tampa that was a three two. Woof! It looked bad. I mean, it was like wow. And I thought, there's a hundred thousand dollars repairs on this thing. Um, but uh, Zillow, I use Zillow, Redfin, Realtor.com, and the MLS listing, and then I go to the GIS and the appraisals and other the other goodies. Is what I'm doing is my research on right. the homes. This one was pretty good. At, Do you go out and look at them? Are you bidding blind. I, I was bidding blind. Well, no, I looked at them. I mean, I looked at them on Zillow and all that. Which, but that doesn't mean you don't know they didn't burn down, right? Or fall into the crack. You know, we're not so California, so we didn't have an earthquake, but. You don't know, but um, I mean, it's basically, no, no, to bid on what I have seen. Them. Basically, that house sold for twenty three thousand dollars. The tax deed on it sold for twenty three thousand um, dollars. But they had valued it. The uh, the ARV on it was probably around four hundred to four hundred and forty five thousand. But then there are certain counties that I don't understand. Like I looked, watched Miami Dade on Thursday. Mm -hmm. And if you tell me that piece of crap was worth six hundred thousand, oh, yeah, Miami, I'm yeah, like, yeah, holy no. moly! Yeah, Miami and those houses, different. tax deed wise, Thank sold. Thank you. So Chris, they starting bid nineteen thousand. They wound up ending up being sold for four sixty four eighty on know, a tax on deed. deed. On a tax deed. That's because everybody in Miami is an expert. Yeah. Now, one of the things. Okay. They run the price up. One of the, when people join our work, just in a conversation with people, um, I think that, especially when they come into our program, I say you should have two financial goals. Chris is, has been a financial advisor, right? That's what you've been doing, or you still do it? For 30 years. 30 years. So I always say you should have a cash flow as well as wealth, right? And take care of the cash flow first. Um, let me see if this is the delivery. Your home delivery order was delivered. Okay. All right, so I got it in the house there. It was delivered. Okay. Refrigerator. I just yeah, left. Yeah. I, I just remember you talking it. about it. I just missed it. They had to cut a hole in the roof. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the only thing is we don't know if it's dented. The only thing is we don't know if it's dented because we didn't tell anybody to look make sure How did they get it in? The front, the front door? Who knows? No, yeah. the sliding glass sliding door. Probably. No, the front door. Front door. Jeez. Okay. It's only 36 inches wide. Yeah, but I don't know if they carried it in because it ain't a wheelchair. Stainless? Yeah. So anyway, let's Bob, back. Bob Catlett did it. All right. Oh, jeez. So, cash flow. The ideal, the ideal objective is to have a monthly cash flow that exceeds your monthly expenses. So you never have to worry, but you, you have a stress-free life at that point. Okay. And then, of course, building wealth. But what would be nice is to have a tax-free income. I don't care how much you want. You want a million-dollar tax-free income? Ten million? You tell me, and I'll tell you how you get a million dollars or whatever amount tax-free income. So, in your career, have you ever sold anybody how to get tax-free income? Yeah. And how do you usually do that? Uh, we either use utilize Roth IRAs. You can also oh, forget, now not the life insurance guy, okay? Yeah, no, no, because that's a total gosh. scam. No, no forget oh, about Roth. Um, forget about I'm talking money that you can spend, not money that's going to a Roth that you can't touch. Money that's going to wealth that you can't touch. I'm, I'm I don't, no, that you no, can't no, touch. no, it's not going to the Roth because you can't touch that money when it goes in the Roth tax rate. You can't touch it for five years or at least fifty nine and a half years old. Well, you can rule seventy two T if you. I'm fifty four. I could touch my Roth, so. Um, you substantially equal payment laws rule 72T under the IRS section code. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not an accountant, so, I don't know that, um, but I just was told that it's 59 and a half years old. Well, you it can touch be, it before 59 and a half. No I have several no clients that have so made enough like a, money. So, you, so someone who isn't and is self-managed and they take the money out to, let's say, do a flip, for example. He can't do it, right? He can't take it. Sure he could. In five sure years, he can take the money out? Sure. Or right now. If you're an SAP, let's say, let's say, okay, so there's two ways. There's one about a Roth a, self directed. You're telling me that or a, a 30, standard. A 30, no. As income or to reinvest? Because you, 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 you can out. invest out of your Pull it out and spend it. You can always invest, but if you're going to set up Rule 72T, you can be, it's over a five year period and based on the evaluation of your Roth IRAs. And this is what happened in 2000, 1999, 2000 when I was in it. And the dot coms came and everybody became instant. I'm worth 20 million bucks, right? right? I, I'm 40 years old, I'm retiring. So they set up rule 72T, the substantially equal payment laws, which is at that time 12% of your IRA. Okay, so you had to take 12% per year for five years, all right? And, and then, then, you could, then you could begin to modify. In traditional IRAs too. No, I'm saying wasn't that non traditional. You're saying this is on Roth now? This well both of them. You could do both of them. Okay. Okay. And um, what does that tell you the seventy two? What does that what does it allow you to do? It allows you to take out the twelve percent 
They modified that because what happened is people started them in 1999. So you're saying you could pull out 12 percent of your whatever's sitting in the Roth per year, per tax year. rate, per and year. you're required to after five years it, it, or only, when? Only if you set up that 72. Thing you're only about. if you set right. up the 72 T. Right, and, and, and starting right. when? 72 T IRS code. Starting when, Chris? Do you have to, is there a waiting period or immediately? Um, you can ostensibly. I think you, now that I don't know. I think you can do it immediately. I think even if you do a conversion, but I will have to. And this can be done at any age. I believe it's, yeah, but you're only, it's only going to be 12, 10, 12 percent. I understand so, that. You can't conver like a conversion from a traditional to a Roth. You can still do it that way. I believe. From well, traditional, you if you convert from traditional to a Roth, I believe taxes. you can. You pay oh, taxes. That, that one, that part, I'm really not that sure. Yeah, so you're going to pay it. taxes on that conversion. Correct. So you're early withdrawal. Of the right. So the reason when you do that, you, you transfer it in a year that your income is low. Right. So right. you don't do it in a year that's you high. Want, you want to take it on a loss year, sure. Right. Okay, yeah, it is, it is, it is both. It's, rule 72T allows you to take early withdrawals from retirement accounts without incurring penalties. Rule 72 is basically best for early retirees or individuals with high balances in their retirement accounts. Set up. But what happened like in 2000, mm -hmm. people set that up, and let's say they had $2 million, and they were said, great, I live on $200,000 a year. Then 2000 comes, and their $2 million turns into $500,000. And so then it starts dropping. And so for the next five years, they're required to take $200,000, and basically they went bankrupt in two and a half to three years. It's, that fast, it was especially the dot com guys. Yeah, they got killed on it. Yeah, I had a lot of guys get killed on that. Twelve percent could have been a million dollars or more, and whatever. And yeah, and then all of a sudden it's gone. And then, then because they didn't for the next five years, they get penalized. Right. So okay. then, after graduation, you so just got penalized. You have to be rude to Let's stop talking about that. Okay. Because, that's, because it really is not what I was talking about. Because you'd have to have a million dollars in your account, right? And you'd only be able to take out one hundred twenty thousand. Okay. So that's not a hundred. That's not a million dollar tax free income, right? But if you take it out of a Roth IRA. Okay, but in order to make them, no, if you, you just, let's see if I understood you. If I have a million dollars sitting in my Roth and I've set it up as a 72, I can pull out 12% of that per year. For five years. Is that correct? For five years. They modified it too. But is it Let correct? Let me get you the exact But it's only 12%, right? That's still 60% over five years. That's only 600,000 over five years. But each year it's 120,000 right. a year. I'm talking about right. getting a million dollar tax free income. That's only 120. Right. Far from it. Right. You're not going to do it the way he's talking about. Right. You'd have to have a hundred million in there. Right? So how are you taking your Roth and making it? No, I'm not so talking about a Roth. Roth. Okay, forget about a Roth. I'm talking about a tax-free income. Roth is money that you put it in there, and it'll be tax-free when you take it out. But I'm talking about living on tax-free money. Okay. There's also the difference between ordinary income and capital gains, long term. What you're doing, um, depending on if you sell them, could be ordinary income. If you hold on to it more than a year, then obviously it won't be. Right. Um, but wholesaling. Is ordinary income. Sure. So the idea okay. is to the idea is to do two things, right? And I'm not a financial advisor, but I've been advised by extremely wealthy people, right? And this is what they do: they do the IRAs, they do all kinds of trusts, but they also then um, are buying properties that appreciate, and then they refinance them. And when the money that you borrow is 100% tax free, you don't pay taxes on that. So they set up a cash flow. And then they say, and they and they don't want uh, even rich dad poor dad. They also about you know, I don't know if you, what your advice was to was should my house be paid in full or not be paid in full? Should I pay my, my should I pay my should I allow my all my investments to be free free and clear so I don't have to worry about them? No, take the money out of it and grow more because that's good debt, not bad debt because that's how millionaires borrow millions of dollars a year tax free. If you have a million a hundred million dollars piece of property and you refinance and you pull ten million dollars out. The rents have gone up over the last five or six years to equal the extra payment that you're having now. So your tenants pay your salary, and it's free. It's free money. You so don't pay income tax. Oh, so you're, missing, you're talking about like starting an LLC, having the LLC become the owner of the the properties, and then nope. you're borrowing Trust. money from the LLC. No, no. Over time, no, 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 no. no, okay. no. I don't, we, that, that was the next thing because I asked you how you're going to take. We never put. Well, if it's a commercial property, I may put it in an LLC. And but trust, right? only because, no, I put it in trust. The only reason I put it in LLC to start with is because maybe that's the only way I can get the financing, or if I'm doing financing. Uh -huh. but other than that, I bought every, all properties in a land trust because we're in Florida, and Florida is one of six states that have statutes on land trust. Every other state you can do a, a trust. Certain states won't let you label it a land trust, but they'll be able to label it as a grantor trust because there's an irrevocable trust and there's revocable trust. A land trust is revocable, it means that you still have control over it. So if you got sued, that's personal property. It's no different than a stock account or, uh, or other things that you own, but a custodian takes care of it for you, right, that can be taken away from you. So if you've gotten a bad lawsuit 
and they found out you're a beneficiary to through your LLCs, they can come and get that. Trust. Me. Right. So, um, so, but it hides. It's not. It's not asset protection. But if you put it in a revocable trust. You no longer have control of it. You, no longer, you don't own them in either one. When you put it into a land trust, the trustee owns the property, not you. You own the trust. The trust is nothing more than a contract between the grantor and the trustee. So the trust can't own the property. It's a contract. You can't own anything. It's a contract. Right? So the trustee owns the property legally. So therefore, your name is not on any property appraisal's office. So you're driving your car at, at 3 o'clock today. No, at 12 o'clock today. It's actually starting early started. The Anderson Advisory Group, where they're the best attorneys in the United States when it comes to asset protection and tax, uh, uh, tax saving on taxes. Why? Because these attorneys own themselves over 400 single-family homes. They own mo multiple ma multi-family properties. They own multiple mobile home parks, and yet they teach attorneys. They, they're lawyers, right? And they teach all this stuff. And there's a six-hour presentation. They do it once a month. But they're out, it starts at 9 o'clock in the morning for a specific time. So it starts at, si at 12 here and it goes to 6 p.m. But anyway, um, in Florida is the only state in the in the country that if you do a land trust, the beneficiary is protected. That if there's a lawsuit on the property, it does not attach to the beneficiary. Unless the beneficiary went on the property and physically did some electrical work, and that's what electrocuted somebody, you're, you're going, you're, you got a problem. But if you didn't do anything, it's just being the, the beneficiary, you can't be sued. In every other state, the beneficiary is liable. So therefore, what he recommends, if you do do a land trust in any other state, you make the beneficiary an LLC. We make the beneficiaries in Florida LLCs anyway. So we buy in that, we buy them in that. But the, where the money is at is in building up your passive income. And, and as I mentioned to you before, um, and really we've gotten off, and I would prefer if everybody would like me to, unless you want me to continue with the commercial stuff and bigger dollars, is to finish on the fix and flips of what we were talking about. That's up to you because it's basically you, you, you three guys. Um, you know, and you have. Uh, What's the first name again? Rushney. Rushney. Rushney with an R. Okay. Rushney. So, what, what, should we continue talking about the fix and flips, or do you want me to continue about commercial, commercial, commercial or fix and mobile home parks, which, which Warren Buffett is the largest manufacturer well, you of like manufactured homes? I'm, I've actually, like, like I told you, I have 17 liens in Gilchrist County, and they're all mobile homes. Mm -hmm. Now they're not in mobile home parks, even though they're, I guess, surrounded by mobile homes. They're on, they're on property. They're, they're on their own property. parcel of land. They're on their own parcel of land. Right. I guess. They, they have the titles be retired. See, when you buy a mobile home, it's licensed through the Department of Motor Vehicles. Just like we put a tag on the back of our car every year. If it's in a park, not on its own piece of property, the window there'll be a little sticker every year. You got to renew yeah. it. If you take it off the property and you bring it on a piece of property. You can retire the certificate, which will now make it an improvement to the land, and now it'll be recorded in the deed that there's a manufactured home on the property, and it'll have to serve. That means? Yes. Okay, I don't sound all my thing. It says improvement, right? And improved, and this, right. and yeah, okay. I didn't, right. I didn't know that. I didn't sound mm -hmm. there. So otherwise, it's personal property. If it's not, if it hasn't been retired, right? Then it's a mobile home sitting on there, and it's not part, when it's foreclosed the property. They don't own that that house. You can come take it away mm -hmm. because it was just the land. But if it was retired, what does retired mean? It means you went to the motor vehicle department and said, I no longer want this registered, give me some forms. And you take that over to the clerk of the court or the property appraisal office and do the same thing and notify them and you pay a fine, a fee, so that next year now they can raise your taxes because you just improved the property. But if they don't renew it, it automatically expires. Yeah, but nobody's policing. Very rare does the motor vehicle send somebody around to mobile home parks. Uh, take a picture of that one there. It happens, but it's very rare. Very so rare. with the mobile homes, you just buy them and rent them. Right? No. So in the mobile home park arena, there's two models. There's the apartment model, which means that you own the houses and you're renting the land and lot. And the best model is the land model, where you don't own any of the houses, you just rent a parking lot for mobile homes. So let's let's look at it this way. What if you bought a mobile home park and the streets were owned by the city? You got no maintenance on that, no repairs. What if it was water city water and city sewer billed directly to each person? So you have no control. You, you don't have to worry about infrastructure, of sewer lines, water lines, any of that. You have to worry about the roads, those are your major. So what's your expense? And you don't have to worry about the house because you don't own it, so you don't have to fix the plumbing or anything else, right? You just collect rent. It's like having a parking lot in New York City, right? Where you can get unbelievable what you're going to get because the par parking is at a premium in New York City, right? Well, you have a mobile home park parking lot. So the cash flow on that is incredible because it has the highest cash flow of any commercial property bar none. 
Um, and so the lot metal would be the best. There's variations where you can have a little of both. Uh, it could be a combination with some of them are RVs in there, but you can buy them, as I was saying before, at a 10 cap, but have a 20 cash, 20 cash on cash return or higher because you leverage it and you can get in at high cap rates on mobile home parks, like a 10 cap. Do you know what cap rates are? Uh, cap rates are the, the interest rate that, or the rate of return that is it's on your money. It's a rate, only if you pay cash. It's, cap rate stands for capitalization rate. If you bought something for 100% cash, it's really what your rate of, what, what's your rate of return. So if you bought a million dollar piece of property and it was making $100,000 net, what we call NOI, net operating income, if every conceivable expense, whether that be property taxes, insurances, maintenance, repairs, banking, anything other than debt service, which is mortgage payments. You don't consume, that's not an expense, it's called debt service. So if every conceivable thing, it makes $100,000. If you paid cash, you got a 10% return on your money, that's a 10 cap. But what if it, it, and the property will, will always still be a 10 cap? I don't care if you paid $2 million for it, you paid a half a million dollars for it, it's still only making $100,000 a year, so it's still a 10 cap until you change it. Well, no, I'm sorry, take that back, because if you bought it for $2 million, it's different. It, if you bought it for the million dollars, it's a 10 cap, and until you do something, the cap rate stays the same, but the cash flow can change. So how does the cash flow change? You're making $100,000 a year. You put $100,000 down, you finance 900000 at 5%, let's say, 30 years amortization, your, month, your yearly debt service will be $58,000. So you're collecting $100,000, you spend fifty eight dollars of it on the mortgage, so it leaves you with $42,000. You only put up $100,000, now you got a 42% return on a 10 cap. You can't do that in apartment buildings. You can't do that in anything else in mobile home parks. That's not going to happen. So the cash flow is incredible. Do you know what I mean? Small mobile home parks for sale? Mm -hmm. You don't want small. You want large. Okay. Well, I would imagine a large one is going to cost tens, if not hundreds, of millions of it dollars. It can. We don't want to go to a large, large. We want 50 to 100 units. Right. So, see, to me, that would be large. No, large would be 100 to 500 or 1,000 units. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And once again, I'm, I don't know. Right. So, uh, mom and pop can still own a 50 unit to 100 unit mobile home park. It's like that. That's how the villages started, no? Basically. That's correct. There are about 44,000 parks in the United States. 90% of them are owned by mom and pops. Only about 4,400 are owned by big industrial, like big corporations, hedge, hedge funds. The hedge funds, some of the largest hedge funds, Blackstone, yeah. heavily involved. They just, two years ago, they spent half a million, half a billion dollars to work a couple, two parts. And then she's going to grab the toffees for me. Okay. Here's our bacon. So, um, this is for you. Just watch your teeth. Yeah. Ooh, big burger. Thank you. And then this one's for you. This is a big burger. Huh? Yeah, yeah. this is a big burger. Yeah, it's a big burger. It's nice. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Ice. So, the, here's the beauty behind, no matter what kind of business you go into, Warren Buffett, one of the wealthiest men in the world, is the largest manufacturer of manufactured homes. Because after 1976, when I called mobile homes, they called it manufactured homes. Because they're now, they're built through a certain code and everything. And so he uh, also owns two banks. One finances the parks, one finances the houses. He came up with a... a two largest things. He, termined, he, he coined a phrase, economic moat. And what he means by that is that when he buys a business, he certainly buys many different businesses, he wants to make sure that no other business can put him out of business. You go buy an apartment building, especially here in Florida, it doesn't happen all over the country, but no matter where you go, there, there are these massive big new apartment building complexes being built. They got the swimming pool, they got the clubhouse, they got those, you know, the workout machine so you don't have to pay the money for the gym anymore. And you got a 20, 30, 50, 10, you know, as long as it's over five units, otherwise it's residential. Five doors or more is commercial. And so you raise your rent $50, and the tenant say, honey, they're offering a one month free down the street, you know, and it's around the same price if it's $50. Yeah, you know, they're $50 more, but if he's gonna raise the price, let's move there, we get a rent free, and we we'll, I can cancel the gym membership. So you lose your tenant. So you lose them because there's no economic, your, your light is on, oh. on, on your flashlight. So you, so, so you, so a business can put you out of business. Same thing in a self storage facility, which are oversaturated. Same thing with self, with Airbnbs, oversaturated. Anything in this world, I don't care. We can look on this table. Supply and demand. There isn't anybody who's going to argue that if you've got an unbelievable supply, a demand, but a small supply, you should then do that, right? That money. So, is there any city in the United States that has enough affordable housing? That has unaffordable housing? No, does it, is there no. enough affordable housing no. in any city in the not United States? Really. No. Not really. No, no, not really. There isn't any. <laughs> enough. I'll be right back. Okay. okay. 
But so anyway, some of the next, right? next, I want to talk about parking lots. Okay. <laughs> yeah. you, have you guys ever bought a parking lot? No, I went not interested no, in parking lots. You know, I mean, if it's cash flowing and I don't have to operate it. Everything's about the math. Everything's about, about math. a parking lot, chain link fencing it in. Congratulations, boat storage. Mm -hmm. Oh. Well, I mean, same thing as our RV storage or our self storage facility. Get the hot sauce, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. the three of us, man. Yeah, French toast. Yep. Chicken omelet. Have we got syrup this on the table? This is for you. Um, there's a syrup there and a syrup down there. Don't grab another one. Oh, good. Okay. Hash browns with the omelet. Hash browns. French toast. Mm -hmm. French toast? French toast, Eric, anybody? Eric, did you do French toast? Yes. And then the classic with the hollandaise on the side. Yes. All right, so I need ice, iced coffee, and what else? Unsweet. Unsweet, and are you okay? Okay. Uh, do, I do I look like I'm not? Yeah. You were just saying that. He hasn't been to his burger yet, that's why she's asking. He was like, you He was waiting for everybody else. Oh, okay. Um, do you guys like Could you pass the, the ketchup down for Grits. Thank you. Ice coffee and ice. Ice tea. Ice tea, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> it clicked. <laughs> so they get served to come to court, and then for the judge, and if they show up, they're going to argue why they think they have a right to it. If nobody shows up, the judge is going to declare the, a, clear, a clear title, and then they'll issue you a new title. There'll be no liens on it. Mm -hmm. That's called a quiet title. So here's the question. Huh? I, I have two other homes that I have. One is in Pennsylvania. It's worth about a million and a half. And I have one out in Sedona, Arizona. It's worth a million. Uh -huh. And if I, let's say I sell the house out in Sedona, I'm going to have like 100000 of tax on that. Would you suggest putting that into a trust? I was just, if you don't need the money, I was just doing a 1031 exchange. And basically, you're taking all the money that you sell in proceeds and you're buying another property in a 1031 exchange. Or two. Or two properties, taking the proceeds and splitting it up. And now you're not paying on any taxes and all that money is rolled into the next property tax free. Are those no. rentals? <clears throat> no, no, we actually own them. So they're just one of the second homes. You live in one? Yeah. No, you live here in Florida. Yeah. Is one of them you considered live. your primary residence? But it, there's an exemption, and I think it's I think it's a half a million dollars for a single, and it might be a million for a couple. I think it's two fifty each. Huh? What? I'm sorry, I'm sorry out loud. I think it's two fifty each. What you're going to Yeah, we have to Google. You have to Google it. What is the one-time exemption for not? I thought the one-time exemption. The last one I've heard of was a million dollars. Think now whether that's married or unmarried or whatnot. I, no, I, it's I, different for single versus married. My question though too is on the 1031s though. It's got to be a like-to-like -like property. You can't take a house and go to a, an apartment building. You, you can't take a house. It's real estate. And go to uh, real estate. It's real estate. You can't buy stock. But didn't they didn't they tighten that up a few no, years ago? Because no. I had a couple clients that got some deep crap over that. No. Because they they took their home 1031 it into a gas station. That's right, that's which was a business. business. That's, that's a business. business. It's different. But it's also property. But they couldn't business. They had to buy two. They had to separate it by the business, by the real estate, the contract, the property, and then there's a business involved in that. Yes, we're done. Um, had they okay. done that, it wouldn't okay. be a problem. So, so, he, so I could take my single family dwelling. I'm about to sell my house down in in Fish Hop, down in Tampa, because um, I've now moved up here to, to Mount Dora. Um, I love Mount Dora. It's beautiful. And it's, it's the house we live in, I love it, and I love the land, and it's yeah, really pretty. It's on a private lake. It's really, I like it. I like my bunny rabbits. I got bunny <laughs> rabbits in the backyard. Me too, me too. Um, okay, so before I actually change everything up here to this residency, I need to get that thing gone. And then I won't pay any gains on it anyway. Was that your personal home? Yeah. Okay. So you won't pay any gains as long as you reinvest it within two years. Well, I don't have to pay any taxes now. One time, one time exemption. Yeah. What tax are you talking about? Property taxes or capital gains taxes? I don't think I pay. I mean, you know, I could pay any tax. Do you pay taxes on your primary residence? Property if you tax. sell it? Yeah, if you've been in it more than three years? No, no. You, you, if, if you've two of the last five is the, is the requirement. Right. Okay. Two of the last five. No, when you sell it, there's no capital gains, but you have two years to reinvest it. If you don't reinvest it within <coughs> two years and buy another house, then it's a one time exemption of, I think it's a half a million dollars. Uh, if, in other words, if you sold it for six hundred thousand, let's say I'm right, I'm, I don't know the dollar number. Okay, when I bought it for three fifty, it's, it's probably going to sell for one four. Okay, but well, well, hear, hear me out for so, a moment. It doesn't matter okay. what it sells for, what you pay for that. That's a part of the equation. Okay, it's a one-time exemption that if you take your personal home 
and you don't buy another home within two years, and let's say I'm right, I, I don't know if I'm right, but let's say it's a one-time exemption in your life that you can sell a personal residence up to $500,000, not reinvest it, and you don't have to pay any capital gains on it. Well, let's say you sold it for six hundred thousand, and the five hundred, and you'd know capital gains on the hundred thousand dollars. If it's a married couple, it's a million dollars. So as long as you either take the exemption, but then you can never do it again, right? It's a one-time life exem ex uh, exemption. I'm, I'm not explaining it well because I see the. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm sitting here doing oh, calculations you're just, you're counting, in my okay, head. Okay, okay. Um, um, you're going to make more than five hundred. Because if you bought it for three fifty, that's going to sell. Has you can take the remainder. It, it has nothing to do with the profit on it. It has to do with the dollar amount you're selling it for. So uh, anything over five hundred thousand in profit, if he's correct on the exact numbers, because I'm th I thought it, I thought it was two hundred thousand, but it could be five hundred. How does the exemption on selling your primary residence work? Hey Siri, what's the one-time exemption on selling your pri primary Siri. residence? Up to five hundred thousand and filing joint. Huh? I found this on the web. It is two fifty. So it's two fifty and five. I thought it was two hundred. Yeah. Okay, so it's two fifty and five hundred. So you're saying if I don't invest that money in another home, another piece of real estate, I'm going to wind up owning about no personal property. Personal property. That, it's got to be your again where you where you have your at license address home. Where you that pay house taxes. paid off too. Doesn't matter. Listen to what we're telling you. So, so I'm going to owe about five hundred to six hundred thousand in taxes. You're married, right? Nope. So you're single. Yep. So you want to get a two hundred fifty thousand deduction. Yep. So if you sell for how much? <coughs> mill four. So that means oh, million two. In I've taxes. got a million one in gain. In, exactly. And I'm in the thirty six percent bracket. Correct. So now, so you roll all of that into a ten thirty one and you buy another piece of property and you don't pay any taxes. Or you buy two. So you, it depends what you want to do. If you want cash flow. Right, that's why I was asking if they were rentals before. So let's go back to the mobile home It could home be a commercial property. Let me, let me, give, let me give them an example. Property. Let me give them an example. When we, the, we, you know, talked about Ted Thomas. There isn't a, there isn't a home study course or boot camp that you can talk about a, an asset class that Eric and I have to take them to class from the, from the top educator. Ted Thomas, doesn't matter if it's some storage facilities, mobile home parks. Ones that we took the mobile home parks for, they're the fifth largest mobile home park owners in the United States. And my family, my mom, built one in Tampa, just south of Tampa, back in the 70s. But their idea is they won't buy another park unless they could turn around and sell it within two years and make a million dollars on it. So what they'll do is they'll buy this park, let's say they buy it for a million dollars. Did you see it do a separate check? I didn't get any checks, no. Well, well this one was sitting in front of you. Oh, is that what that paper. is? I thought that was a piece of scrap paper. Yeah. So, let's say you have this park, right? And you improved it. So, as a matter of fact, I, I, I do webinars. Eric and I do webinars. The first Saturday and the third Saturday, every month on Saturday at 10 o'clock in the morning, there's a Zoom meeting. Same place that you found this on, on Meetup. You find this on Meetup or Facebook? Meetup. Okay, on Meetup from our group. Which Not is, my check. I'm still Right, so on Meetup, if you go back to our group, which is Pathway to Financial Freedom with Real Estate, or whatever it's called. Pathway to Financial Real Estate through Pathway to Financial Freedom with Real Estate, or through Real Estate. I've seen you on yeah. uh, YouTube. Right. Me? You're, you're I've seen YouTube. you on YouTube, yeah. actually. So anyway, there's the, every, Saturday, every first Saturday and third Saturday, there's a Zoom meeting. One of them is on how to buy and sell mobile home parks. So one of the things I talk about in there is I show an example. The last thing is I, I, I show you, I'm going I'm to show you how to take a park where it has a $553 monthly net income, and within two years bring it to 16,000 and change monthly net income, take the value that you bought it for $1 million and sell it for $2.5 million or, or, or exchange it uh, two years, within two years for two and a half million. So what you would do, instead of paying the tax on the million and a half dollars profit, you would take that million and a half dollars profit and the million that you paid for it and go buy maybe two or three parks. And then maybe one of those you sell it to keep the other two, so you keep constantly Building up your passive income and your net worth because you're holding on to them, and certain ones you sell. So it depends what you're uh, going back to. I've, no, I've never done a 1031. Well, it just depends um, what your what, what your objective. Done a hell of a lot of 1035s and yeah. Old so you like you'll have a massive tax bite on that unless you do a 1031. <clears throat> you got two years to do it. From but I can take that money and go buy a mobile home park, and that's still considered a like asset. A like no. asset. Uh, no, there's a business in it. No. no, that's a business. Fund. No, you're mixing mixing apples and oranges, guys. The 1031 exchange is apples for apples. The ex exemption one time on your house doesn't mean that you sell your house and take the same amount of money and buy a mobile home park. No, it's got to be reinvested to your other personal house. Then you never pay tax. So, so one of the, one of the ha house hacking, when I, back in 1983, wait, wait, back in 1983 when I was, got my real estate license, 
a young fellow comes in and he bought his grandma's house and he, he says, you know what, I'm fixing this up, then I'm going to sell it, make a couple hundred thousand, I'll buy a bigger house, sell that, fix it up, live in it, sell it, and just keep coming up because it'll be, he's going to work and live for a $5 million house and not pay any income taxes on it because he keeps reinvesting. If I just retain my house and rent it? To